what Hinduism identifies as the major problem of humanity and its solution. Well, the problem is this, that we keep being reborn. So in Hinduism develops this idea of samsara, uh, and what, it's, what samsara means is wandering through or uh, flowing through, and what you're wandering and flowing through is multiple lifetimes. So we're born, we live, we suffer, we die, and we're reborn. And that's seen to be not an opportunity like it is for many who believe in reincarnation in the West, but as a difficulty, as, as the problem. And we want to get out of that, and we get out of that through moksha, which is spiritual liberation, um, recognizing the unity of the human self with the divine uh, reality through some manner or method, and uh, that sort of pops us out of this, this cycle of life, death, and rebirth. And you say that Hinduism, of all the major faiths that you study, is the least dogmatic and the most diverse internally. That's right, because Hindus have had a strategy of meeting with other religions, and they've met with so many of them over the years by basically accommodating and including them. So instead of saying, no, you know, we have the one true God, your God is false, they say yes, and they bring them in. And so Hinduism over time just becomes, rather than getting sort of more defined over against its enemies, it becomes more and more inclusive of them. So as the Buddhists arrive, then the Hindus say, oh, well, Buddha, you know, he's a incarnation of Vishnu, our, our God Vishnu, or, oh, here comes Jesus. Oh, he's an incarnation of Vishnu also. And there isn't a pope, there isn't a creed, there isn't a sort of centralized structure that's able to define orthodoxy, nor is there much interest in defining orthodoxy. And so it's just this real big tent of a religion, Hinduism. Now, let's talk for a minute about the origins of Hinduism. When can you date it from, and I believe it emerged in the Indus Valley of India? Yeah, it goes back really far. I mean, it's one of our most ancient uh, religions. We have this this sort of proto-Hinduism or of a pre-Hinduism that's called Indus Valley Civilization that maybe goes back to something like 2500 to 1500 BCE, uh, before Jesus. And here we have sort of hints of the possibilities of Hinduism. We don't have a sense of the idea of samsara and moksha that I just described, but we have some female goddesses that may have been worshipped. We have some images of possibly divinities doing something that's like yoga. We have animals that seem to be sacrificed. We have ritual bathing. We have some building mm -hmm. blocks of Hinduism, basically. And there's no, like, one person you can name as a founder of Hinduism. Like, you could talk about um, Confucius or Jesus or Mohammed or something. That's right. It just sort of recedes back into ancient -er and ancient -er history. We don't have a founder. Mm. It, part of the title of this period, though, is Bhakti Yoga, and a lot of us connect yoga with Hinduism. And, of course, a lot of people today use yoga for everything under the sun that doesn't have anything to do with religion. They do it for well-being, to lose weight, for whatever. What's the connection of yoga to Hinduism? Well, yoga is a uh, discipline. So um, the classic goal for yoga in ancient Hinduism, and it is a Hindu practice, would be to achieve that union of self and God. So it's related to the word yoke. So you yoke the self to God in order to achieve moksha, in order to achieve spiritual liberation, to realize the deathless eternal part of yourself and to yoke it to um, the deathless eternal reality out there, which is, which is Brahman. Mm. Now, in terms of religious texts, there are the Vedas, the Upanishads, but... The one that's considered the most important, I believe, in Hinduism is the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which is, you say, a dialogue on the ethics of war. Can, can you talk about that book? Yeah, so what happens, which to me is fascinating in the development of Hinduism, is you move from scriptures in the Vedas, which are ritual manuals, to scriptures with the Upanishads, which are philosophical texts, to stories, to epics. And the tradition really now becomes more of a narrative and storytelling tradition. And these are massive stories like in the Mahabharata, which is the broader text that the Bhagavad Gita is a teeny piece of. You know, these are many, many times over the length of the Bible. Um, and in the Bhagavad Gita, 
what you have is a, is a war between two families, and you have this person, Arjuna, who's in the Pandava family, and he's about to go to war, and it's his duty, according to the caste ethics of Hinduism, as a warrior to fight. But he realizes that as he goes to war, he's going to be fighting with his kinsmen, with his cousins, and and he's going to have to kill them, and and that's not good, you know. So he's sort of caught between two two duties, and he gets in a basically a philosophical discussion with his uh, charioteer, who turns out to be um, Krishna. Uh, this is a lovely thing about Hindu epics is that you never really know who's who. You know, mm-hmm. people can sort of shape shift and take different forms, and mm-hmm. um, there's this yeah, it's fascinating. So yeah. anyway, um, and the argument becomes. You know, fight and do the war, says the charioteer, who is Krishna, but don't be attached to the fruits of your actions. In other words, give them up to God. And it develops in this text a new way of being a Hindu where you can get to the the goal of moksha through a kind of renunciation of philosophical uh, Hinduism, but you can also get there by loving God and you can also get there by action in the world. And so it opens up the Hindu religious goal to all kinds of people, including warriors, including um, everyday housewives and uh, and husbands. Now, is Hinduism linked at all to the caste system in India? Oh my gosh, I get in so much trouble about this. I, I had had a little fight in D.C. the other day with the Hindu about this. Um, yes, the answer is yes. I mean, you know, a lot of contemporary Hindus want to say, you know, make this sort of culture social religious distinction and say, well, that's a cultural thing. It has nothing to do with Hinduism. And of course, I've had Hindus was, say that to me on this show. Yeah, and, you know, it was banished, you know, by the British, um, you know, hundreds of years ago. And, and but it persists. And if you're in India, everybody in India knows the caste of everybody else. I mean, it's quite astonishing. So yes, caste is part of Hinduism. It's something that Hindus in the West are embarrassed about. It's something that intellectuals try to banish. But it has uh, traditionally been been a part of the uh, of the religion, and it persists against the better judgment of of many Hindus. It's something that's still there in, mm-hmm. in the culture today. And I think it would be fair to say the majority of Hindus do want to get rid of it. Well, they want to get rid of it, but they don't want their kids to marry outside of their caste. Oh, okay. So that's I mean, the tradition so, in I mean, India. Well, it's the tradition in America too. I mean, my students in, my students at Boston University are pretty much marrying inside their caste. Hmm. Now, the gods of Hinduism, there are many and they're colorful. In fact, this is probably the most colorful of all the religions that you describe. You know, you have Ganesha, who has the head of an elephant. You have the woman who's dancing with, I forget, eight arms, I think it is. Who yeah. are these gods? What, describe that pantheon, if you will, in Hinduism. Right. Let me say quickly that there are many Hindus both in America and in India, who say there's only one God in Hinduism. Hmm. So there's a fascinating debate about whether Hinduism is monotheistic or polytheistic. On the surface, it certainly seems to be polytheistic because you have all these gods and they they talk to each other, they fight with each other, they tease and trick each other. They have these fabulous epics written about them. And on that level of multiple gods, there's often um, said to be a trinity where there's Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the sustainer, and Shiva, the destroyer. So when mm-hmm. when the world needs to be created, that's Brahma's job. When the world needs to be sustained, that's Vishnu's job. When the world needs to be destroyed, that's Shiva's job. And remember this this problem, this master metaphor in Hinduism of samsara, the, the wandering, flowing through cycle of life, death, and rebirth, that applies to human life, but also applies to the cosmos. So the, the world we're living in now was created at one point, but before that it was created another cosmos was was destroyed and previously created, etc. But Brahma really isn't much worshipped in India, so you're not going to find a lot of Brahma temples. Brahma is a little bit like uh, the high god actually in the Yoruba tradition, but also the god of deism that sort of makes the world but doesn't really have much of a job. So mm-hmm. the real trinity, I, I think, is really uh, Vishnu and Shiva and then the Mahadevi, the great goddess, which is interesting that there are female divinities in Hinduism that are very important, and this is one feature of Hinduism that's very attractive to uh, to feminists. Mm-hmm. Now, there is also a fascinating set of prayers and rituals in Hinduism, and I know that I visited an ashram that was founded 
by a Hindu, and I was at the puja, which is their, I think, their central ritual, and it certainly flourishes in symbolism. I, I can remember, since I'm a Roman Catholic myself, I looked and I thought, my goodness, Hindus are the Roman Catholics of the East, in the, in the sense of their use of symbols, almost sacramental kinds of uh, signs. Can you talk about the puja or the rituals of Hinduism? Yeah, that's an interesting comparison. I think there's something to that. I hadn't actually thought about that so much in the sense that in Catholicism you have sacraments that um, have to ha- you have to have stuff for them, right? You have to have bread right. or, or, or water or, or oil. And similarly, stuff is part of Hindu rituals too, right? You have fire. You have, you have rice that's given as an offering. And, you know, it's fascinating. It's amazing. If you go to a Hindu temple, they don't, they don't have services typically in the same way that you think of, oh, you go to church at 11 in the morning. Temples are just open and you just go by yourself with your family and you bring an offering to the divinity and then you're given something back. So often you'll bring food and then you're given back this food that's kind of been made sacred by the god and by the priest. Um, my colleague uh, Diana Eck at Harvard has written this mm-hmm. wonderful book about Hindu puja Hindu ritual, where she argues that what is really the core of the the puja is actually sight. In other words, that it's about seeing and being seen. And the word in Hinduism is darshan. Now, that's not like going to a nightclub to see and be seen Mm -hmm. because you're not being seen by others. You're being seen by the divinity. And you have this moment of intimate encounter that is that devotion that is the Hindu way of devotion, as I call it in the book. Um, where you have this kind of love exchange between the two of you. And you mentioned Darshan. There is a hugging saint of Hinduism called Amma, and she goes around literally hugging people, and she's giving Darshan. That's what she says. And that's sort of a spreading of love or compassion. Yeah, that's right. And you, um, and she's sort of internationally famous, and uh, I think that epitomizes the way of devotion piece of Hinduism, but it also epitomizes the fact that in Hinduism you have a kind of fluidity between who's a god and who's a human. There really isn't a distinction between the self, the Atman, the, the, the essence of the human being, and Brahman, the essence of God. And since that's the case, humans can be gods of a sort, you know, the, who, to, to whom you can go and have darshan, to whom you can uh, devote yourself in a way. And this makes especially Christians in the West really nervous, you know, because it sounds like idolatry, right? You're worshiping how can you worship another human being? But humans can have that capacity in the, in the Hindu tradition. All right. And finally, how would you characterize Hinduism's influence in the world at large? It has largely been confined to India, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, we have it in Europe. We have it in the United States. We have it in Bali. But I think Hinduism is a wonderful example of Um, how to get along across uh, religious boundaries. I mean, the Hindus have been, because of their sort of standing at a sort of crossroads in the world and because of their strategy of inclusion, they've been very good at cultivating conversations from ancient times with Buddhists, with Muslims more recently, and then with Christians. And uh, Hindus are very good at this, and I think we can learn from them how to have informed um, constructive conversations across religious boundaries without giving up our own our own religious commitments along the way. Stephen Prothero is the author of God is Not One, 